I'm so happy everyone that came, but there were so many last minute additions that we were just like, this isn't going to work. We had one friend that was like, hey, I'm coming, bring my girlfriend. Great, that's fine. And then he's like, can I invite my roommate? And I'm friends with the roommate, but we didn't invite him because we knew we didn't have the space. And so what am I, what am I supposed to say? No. Can't say no. And this guy's going to hate my guts and think I don't want to include him. And mm -hmm. that's not, that's the farthest from the truth. Right. It's because we don't have space. And I'm sorry, you just got to say no to some people, but you can't say that. So I said, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm very concerned about the size, uh, about the space. We have like 16 people coming now. And then my friend, you know, that's my way of saying like, yeah, of course he's invited, but don't invite him. And my friend responded, he's like, okay, I get it. Um, I'll send like a pity invite uh, and like say it in a tone that makes it not makes like an him... attractive, fun plan. Right, 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 smart. And so he said that he'd do that five minutes later. He wants to come. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior I engaged in. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Oops the Podcast. Julio Gallarotti, Ryan Lynch, here yo, we are. Yo, 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 it's snowing outside. It's snowing outside. The first time snow has stuck... I don't think it even did last year, bro. First time since I've lived in New York. Really? Yeah, it's magical. How long have you lived here again? Two years? Almost two years now. Yeah, yeah. It's nice and a little snow accruing, uh, and it appears like it's here to stay because it's going to be cold the next few days. So here we are, first snow of the year. I personally am fine with it not snowing, uh, despite potential climate implications. But fear not, this is not a climate change podcast exclusively, so we're not only going to sit here and talk about it. Thank you to everybody who came out to Phoenix and San Diego. Shows were awesome. It rocked. Love to see it. I'm going to be in Stamford on the 1st of February, and then at Union Hall in Brooklyn, leading up to taping my special, I think it's the 13th, running the hour, and then I'm going to be taping my special the 16th in Chicago. Uh, those tickets are moving, so grab some while they are still available. And then hope to fill up my road schedule beyond that for the rest of the year. Come to your city, see you there. Uh, Lynch will be with me in Stamford on the 1st. Stamford. Stamford, Connecticut. Love Stamford, Connecticut. That's going to be great. Yeah. So here we are, dude. And, uh, you know, f before I want to have a couple of specific questions to ask you. But before we get into that, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody also who came down to the first Sunshine Comedy Festival in Florida. I had a great time. Congrats to Zach Moore. Uh, who's become a friend of mine at this point, uh, who runs the operation at Coastal Creative, Dan Baxt, anybody uh, who else was, who was involved, Side Splitters, and on all the amazing venues in the area. I think it went off without a hitch. It was successful. I had a great time. Spent a lot of time with a bunch of comics from a bunch of different scenes. A comedy festival really is an interesting beast, and I haven't done one in a while, so it was fun to be down there and to do that. Yeah, that sounds seems like a lot of fun. Yeah, man. And it's an interesting thing too, like a comedy festival, theoretically a lot they, they put together a lot of ensemble shows, right? I've headlined down there a bunch, so like I didn't have my own show in the festival. I was just kind of doing showcase style shows, which is like 10 15 minute sets. I was like, "Oh, it's going to be a breeze." That's an ensemble show? Yeah, I guess. Like I, that's not like a coined term per se, but it just effectively is an ensemble show. Uh-huh. And I just thought, I was like, oh, this is going to be like a vacation. It's going to be relaxing. But something about like the social element of like being in rooms with comics that you didn't, that you don't know. And it's like, oh, which people, sh you know, should I get to know in here? Uh, who are all these people? Blah, blah, blah. That just like adds a heavy element to it. That's kind of stressful um, and, and tiring. So there's like a lot of, at any given moment, even though you don't do a show, you're waking up and you have stuff going on. Like. I had a brunch with a bunch of comedians. It was a lot of fun. It was great. There's parties. There are the different shows that everybody's hanging out at. And like figuring all that out is tiring in its own right somehow, which I thought was, was unique. So I got back feeling pretty tired. Um, and, you know, and dude, yeah, just, just the different things that come along with meeting a bunch of people at once. Like it feels like summer camp. You know, that first couple of days of camp is like really, it used to give me a lot of anxiety. I mean, I went to tennis camp, but still like those two summers that I went, it was crazy to have to meet all these people. It was like super, it gave me a lot of anxiety. I don't know if that I like have social anxiety or something, but I think that this is something that is heavy for everybody. But dude, I remember I walk into the green room and I shook, was shaking people's hands, meeting everybody. And I shook one guy's hand, dude. And he literally like turned away Man. as I met this guy. Like we shook hands and he looked over his shoulder 
And I like I have not been able to stop thinking about it. What was he, was he so rude? What was he looking towards? I don't I don't the next think, handshake. I don't think he was distracted by somebody talking to him. I think he's just like a rude guy. This guy is a piece of shit. Waste <laughs> of life. <laughs> Whoever this guy is. And I started trying to figure it out. Like it really made an impression on me. Like, yeah, this guy's, you know, taking up free real estate in my head, as they say about Drake with Kanye or whatever. But I think this guy was like a new comic. And I think I don't think he was like a guy who's part of any major scene. Like, I think he was just sort of a dude who's kind of there. Like, I doubt he was even on the flyer and the flyer had like 50 names on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think he was just some random guy. Who's a dick. Was he younger than you? Yeah. I bet that pissed you off even more. No, no, it didn't like that. Didn't, um, that didn't matter. Like if he, if this guy were to have been a very successful young guy or whatever, and he did that, it would have probably bothered me more. Yes. But the fact that he's just like irrelevant I'm like, okay, this is like some random dude who has no manners. He may have an, a, a condition. If mm. that's the case, I feel better about it. But well. let's assume he doesn't. But I'm going to try my best to remember him forever so I can, yes. get, I can get revenge someday. Yes, making enemies. In some way, he will need me someday and I will be able to be like, fuck no. I hope so. But I'll tell you this. If he does need me someday, I'm sure he'll like come correct in that moment and then I'll completely forgive him. Yeah, well, that's the more alpha move to, to, to make just, him think that you're going to say fuck you and then lend out your hand. He's not even going to remember what he's done. That's the thing about this. That meant nothing. Well, you, you let him know. Like you let him know. I and didn't you in tell the moment. Him, I know. I will. Let in him the know. future, you let him know. Hey, I remember you. You did this to me. And then you make him think that you're not going to help him out. And just when he starts to break, you help <laughs> him out. <laughs> okay. I love that. Well, dude, it also brought something ever else uh, interesting into my sort of sphere. So I've become comfortable now where I'm typically in environments where people know me. So I'm hanging in the New York comedy scene. I know most of the people. I haven't really, I don't really hang in the LA comedy scene much the way that I used to. If I were to, again, I'm sure there'd be like a bit of a learning curve because not everybody would know me. And I'd feel like to some degree, I want them to like know what my deal is and that they should know me or whatever. You know what I mean? But in this specific situation, there were a lot of times where people, other comics in the festival just like, clearly like didn't know who I was and that's fine, but it's an adjustment and it's a good exercise. It's like, you shouldn't be so like ego dependent that you're only putting yourself in situations where people know who you are and are treating you accordingly. You know what I mean? So healthy to do, but also adds an element of sort of heaviness where you're like, Oh, I, I need to like, and my instinct is to try with people. You know what I mean? But sometimes you don't want to be the one who tries too hard. I'm like, oh, I, I met this guy. We didn't like really introduce each other specifically. Like, am I going to follow him? Am I going to make the first move? And it's like, no, I'm not. But then he's not going to follow me. And then we're just never going to like, you know what I mean? But you can't like overthink any of that shit. But you can't help but have those thoughts the whole time. This brought something more specific to up, up to the surface for me as well, uh, which kind of works in the opposite way. It's interesting to see people treat you a certain way because they think they should. Now, those people were certainly at the festival too. And I had a friend with me, uh, my buddy, Ted, who's a comic, Ted Jones. And I'd be hanging with somebody and I'd be like, Oh, that guy's such a great guy. And he'd be like, eh. And I'm like, what do you mean? And we would like talk about it. And it made me realize that maybe this person thought that I was important. So they were really nice to me. They sucked up to me. They listened to what I said. They gave me compliments and I immediately fell for it. Sucking up is an incredibly powerful tool if you're trying to get in somebody's good graces. And maybe Ted had felt, felt that maybe they weren't giving him the same kind of attention type, type of deal. Mm. I will say this. I think it's important to be aware of that dynamic because people who are like that, like that's a character flaw that they have potentially. Or it just means that they're insincere. So it's like you you have to be wary of people who are really nice to people who are more important than them, but are not nice to people who they deem to be less important than them. That's a bad trait. And we may have experienced some of that on the trip, but it's just funny that I was unable to even notice it because I was so I was being swept off my feet, let's mm -hmm. say, by the, some of these people. And I'm like, oh, he's a great guy. Like, I want to have that guy around. Like, it, it worked. 
whatever these people were doing, guy, girl, whatever. I'm not talking about anybody specifically, but it's just an interesting thing. It's a hard skill to develop that bullshit detector. Right, right. Uh, no, it's true. And not in all, like with comedy and with a lot of entertainment adjacent things, like the things that get people ahead are like very relationship based. So it's a little more pervasive than it might be in some other industries where it's more straightforward. But socially, I think it's a thing for people too, but it's true. Like the bullshit detector, it's like people being nice in a calculated way because they think they can gain or that they should align with with specific types of people. It's rampant in comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, Sales would be a great job for those kinds of people. I agree. Because it is, a, it is as much as it is like a team effort and team goals, your book is yours and it's solo and you can put on whatever facade you need to. I've worked with some pretty uh, deceptive people. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. Especially in the sales pit. I'm sure I do. Yeah, it's, uh, it can certainly help you to be ruthless like that, it mm -hmm. seems. Dude, sometimes I'm editing. It's taking me hours and I'm in the zone and then next thing I know, it's like 12.30, 1 p.m. Am I even going to have lunch? Sometimes I just skip lunch mm -hmm. because I can't even, I, I, don't, I don't have time to open up all of these different ingredients and then start cooking and then Dude, preheat totally the oven. Yeah. And I don't want to get fast food because I don't want to be unhealthy. So sometimes don't fall I don't, for the trap. So sometimes I just don't eat. And that's become like a big issue because I'm trying to bulk up this yes, year. Yes, you are. And so uh, we just started partnering up with Factor. So thanks to our friends at Factor, you can forget about the frantic lunch prep mm -hmm. and you can have two minute meals filled with nutrition mm -hmm. and then you can just get back to work. Dude, it's the I don't want to think about it. I agreed. And like, you don't want to fall for the trap of just being like ordering takeout. You're going to get something that's like salty and expensive. Expensive. And like, it's better to just have your meal ready to go. Uh, it's been decided for you so you can't make any bad choices and uh, factors where it's at. It, it accommodates a bunch of different lifestyles and diets. Um, and it is simply the move, dude. So right now, head to factormeals.com. It's F-A-C-T-O-R-M-E-A-L-S. Factormeals.com slash oops50. And use code oops50, that's oops50, to get 50% off, bro. 50% off, that's a lot. That's not 15%. Yep. It's that's, half of 100%. <laughs> <laughs> that's code oops50 at factormeals.com slash oops50 for 50% off. A couple of funny things happened at this festival. First of all, and I wish that I recorded audio for this since I was so successful with the Uber driver thing. Mm. I forgot to do it because I was thinking about recording video and then thought it was like too uh, exploitative. But I was dropping Ted off at the hotel. And as he was getting out of the car, there was this older woman sitting there. She's probably like, not older woman, but like in her 60s. They, again, back to the uh, age being relative. Like when I was younger, I would have been like, that's an older woman. Now mm, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm, she's like mm -hmm. getting there, but she's not older. You know, anyway. So as he gets out of the car, he jokingly is like, you guys need a ride? And they're like, yeah. And the woman's like, yeah, <laughs> actually. <laughs> she's like, we do. And he was like, fuck. And he has, he has a little <laughs> bit of PTSD because one time at Danny's show, he was standing outside of the venue and he basically, it was basically his fault that this homeless guy entered the show. He's like, oh yeah, he's talking to him. He like ends up like telling him to go in the show for some reason. It like was unclear that he was homeless at the time. Then the guy just like ruined the show. Oh. And like every, he was just like heckling, being homeless, being loud, <laughs> oh. being, no, sorry, being homeless in a disruptive way, <laughs> in a way that a homeless person would be Rah! yelling out drunk. I guess the fact that he's homeless didn't matter, whatever. So everybody blamed Ted for that. Uh, which he's, it's taken him a while to live down. So now here he is again, soliciting uh, potentially difficult things. So anyway, it was late at night and the woman's like, do you mind giving me a ride? I'm like, yeah, I can give you a ride. It was like, she was like an older, like getting the older woman. I'm like, bro, I can give this lady a ride. I was like, where, where are you? I was like, if it's on the way, I'd be, I, I, I'll give you a trip. She's like, it's literally two minutes away. I'm like, okay, no problem. She goes, can my friend also come? I'm like, or, well, where's your friend? She's like, she's really drunk. I'm like, okay, wait. Well, how drunk is she? She's like, drunk, but like, she's fine. It's literally two minutes away. I'm like, okay, fine. She says exactly what she needs to say to get her in the car. Right. She's like, Karen, or whatever the girl's name is. Karen, like, come on. And the woman's like, f stumbling, dude. Like, I, mean, I haven't seen like an adult person this drunk. I will say this the most like drunken adults that I've seen there and drunk like this who like aren't homeless is down south. Now, I know Tampa isn't down south. But like I've only seen people this drunk in like Nashville or like on Sixth Street in Texas or like places where like people go and get bombed, New Orleans, whatever. So this woman can barely speak. They put in the address. It's literally two minutes away as promised. And 
Hillary was like, well, why not just make them walk? I'm like, well, they're like older. They're like, you know, that walk at night, they're women. It's like not walkable. It's not like it's dangerous, but I'm like this 65 year old woman. I'll give her a fucking ride. So anyway, we're trying to find the house and we keep driving up to, I'm like, is this it? And the woman's like, I can't see. I'm like, oh. The one friend was not drunk. She was, I was like, if she pukes in the car, I'm going to be really pissed about this. But then we drive up and she's like, you went too far. I'm like, dude. Okay. <laughs> so I end up just going in reverse to letting them out. It ends up working out. But I was like, this is insane. I'm just giving random people a ride, but it's fine. Yeah. And it'll be fine. People always try to ask if they can add one more person. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. We that's, had that's where you get in trouble. Yeah. We had we had a dinner party on Friday and same thing happened. It was supposed to be like seven people. It turned into seventeen. Wow. All because of can I bring so and so? And then so and so asked, Can I bring so and so? Because I don't want so and so to feel well, left out because so and so and so and who is gonna be there. Yeah. Yeah. It turned out to be fine, but there's always the the person that can I oh, can I bring someone? as well well you yeah you and hope that ends that, up souring the situation totally you hope that that's going to work in certain situations like if you're have an event right if i have a comedy show and i've sold a bunch of tickets i'm like okay hopefully there'll be a snowball effect where people are like what are you doing friday and the people are like well i'm going to the show and they're like oh can i come right it can like be a domino effect in a good way but when you're in an apartment like what would you say is the capacity of your apartment for hosting an event no 10 max. at max right so did not like <laughs> So it was like pretty packed in there at one point. We had we had a friend's 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 boyfriend come from Connecticut for this dinner party. He's a cop and he was a big dude. Oh, and he shit. was like the 14th person added out of oh, the list damn. of 17. It was it worked out fine, but man, we were stressed out. We had to <laughs> gut the apartment. It was like the first episode of SpongeBob where all the sardines come to yeah. the bikini uh, to the Krusty Krab. It was <laughs> tight, but it worked yeah. out. It worked out. So uh, wait, so it was a dinner party. Yeah, it was a dinner party. Was it a seated? Like, did you guys cook? Yeah, Vic made sauce. Um, I was uh, just helping out in the kitchen. I got wine. Everyone bought wine, salad, appetizers. Every so it was like a little bit of a potluck. People a bought bit. stuff. Okay. I don't like. I don't like calling it the a term. potluck though. Right. It's kind of. It's kind of gross to me. It just turned but into yeah. that. But you guys were hosting. You cooked. You made pasta. You yeah. like Vic made sauce. So everyone was coming over for the sauce. Yeah. So. And once it happened, was it like uh, buffet style? Like everyone went and served themselves and then figured out where to sit type of deal? No, I kind of like, I kind of played server. Like I walked okay. around, everyone found their spot. Pretty good. Yeah, exactly. We had a, we had a fun thing. We had a, we had a nice Spotify playlist going on, but on the TV, we'd go on YouTube and you know, we'd type in like colorful background and things fun, like that. And fun. then once that video would play through, I'd go up to a different group of people. I'm like, Hey, it's your turn to pick what's on the TV. <laughs> what do you guys want to watch? So somebody wanted to watch Lakers highlights. Somebody wanted to watch hunting. Somebody wanted to watch no just audio dancing, no audio. Cause we have the music going. So and was that a, was that a prerequisite? We were like, you can't like whatever it's going to be. It has to be on mute. Cause we have a playlist that they, 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 they knew what the vibe was, but yeah, I was walking around and you know, we had a nice system. Someone was doing salads and things like that. Some really good friends. Um, That's great, man. and it, yeah, it worked out smoothly, but we were, we were stressed out because our apartment is tight. It's like just under 700 square feet. And I'm, I'm so happy everyone that came, but there were so many last minute additions that we were just like, this isn't going to work. We had one friend that was like, hey, I'm coming, bring my girlfriend. Great, that's fine. And then he's like, can I invite my roommate? And I'm friends with the roommate, but we didn't invite him because we knew we didn't have the space. And so what am I, what am I supposed to say? No. Can't say no. And this guy's going to hate my guts and think I don't want to include him. And mm -hmm. that's not, that's the farthest from the truth. Right. It's because we don't have space. And I'm sorry, you just got to say no to some people, but you can't say that. So I said, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm very concerned about the size uh, about the space we have like 16 people coming now and then my friend you know that's my way of saying like yeah, of course he's invited but don't invite him and my friend responded he's like okay i get it um i'll send like a pity invite uh and like say it in a tone that makes it not it makes like an him... attractive fun plan. right 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 smart and so he said that he'd do that five minutes later he wants to come and so <laughs> it was uh it, Listen, worked, man, it worked it's out gonna, fine it's gonna but... be mostly couples like it's gonna be like i don't know if it's your thing yeah, like it was his thing. I mean, and I'm glad he came. We had a great time. So, was there room for everybody to sit somewhere? Yeah, we made it. Yeah, we made it work. I pulled out my desk. We borrowed stools from our neighbors wow. that were out of town. Thank wow. God, because they would have been invited too. Wow. And uh, it worked out. We had 17 people, and we were just kicking it back for That's like great, five dude. or six hours. That's great. It was fantastic. But what yeah, the it's it's so tough to say no. Yeah. After someone's already totally. one foot in the door of the car to an additional person yeah especially I mean, the drunk one 
Like that's where like it turns into a no. Right, right. Totally. Or it should. Well, yeah, and we're I mean, we're having a wedding invite anxiety for sure. Between our families and between all of our friends, like it's just gonna get out of hand really quick. So I think there will be some certain people who are hurt that they don't get invited, but there's just nothing we can do. And it gives me new light into like understanding when I didn't get invited now that I'm planning one. I'm like, oh, like you need to cut people. You just need to. And and it doesn't mean that they didn't want to invite you. It's just like it was going to start getting expensive. They had a budget, whatever. And ours is going to be huge. And we still aren't going to be able to have everybody, you know. So that's interesting. Um, But funny story from the uh, from the trip. Don't clip this because this this guy's gonna want to clip this story, and I don't want to tell this guy's story and try to make a clip out of it. You okay. can keep that in the episode. Like this I is know. this is how good this story is. Uh, so I see this this uh, this comic that I'm friends with. Now, I'm not gonna say his name just in case he doesn't want this being out there, but he probably wouldn't give a shit. So he had his own show at the festival. Uh, I see him. I'm like, dude, how was the show? He's like, man, it was terrible. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And I just figure he's going to be like, the venue was shitty. Like, it was dimly lit. Nobody came. But it, it was way more specific. And it was a crazy story. So before the show, he's in the parking lot or something. And he sees some guy who's coming to the show. And somehow, it became apparent that it was the, my friend's show. And you'd think, well, of course this guy knows it's his show. But this guy made it very clear that he was not, that he did not know who my friend was. And he's like, you better, are you funny? You better be funny, which is an annoying thing to happen. You're like, okay, great. Like, here we go. Before the show's even started, I know I have to deal with this guy. Um, and the guys in the show, there's only 10 or 12 people there. Two of them are his parents and this guy's there too. So he starts talking and he's like, <laughs> he's like, oh, I remember you from the parking lot. The guy immediately is like, ah, oh, yeah, like. I did not come here to see you specifically. Like, you better be funny. Like, starts being a dick. Whatever. Still not even that big of a deal. So he's like, all right, buddy. Ha ha. He's like, what do you do for work? And the guy's like, your mom. And his mom is there. His dad gets up and starts trying to fight the guy. <laughs> 12 person audience. At six minutes into the show. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to fuck you up or something. They start going at it. They're yelling. The guy like leaves. He like chases after him. He's threatening to call the cops. Show ends seven minutes. And they're like, guys, we have to stop the show. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, damn, that is accurately terrible. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was going to be so specific. That is terrible. That's crazy. Um, So anyway. Do you ever have any fear with your parents come to shows of just like any altercations or dealing with any outside things that could happen with them being involved not before this happened yeah uh but still i would say no like i don't i don't you know i'd say the risk is fairly low i don't know how that would even happen the only thing i don't like i don't like when my parents are there when there aren't a lot of people there Mm. it makes it feel Mm pikerish where it's like oh this guy like nobody comes to his shows like a large percentage of the audience are this guy's family so unless it's like a really packed show, I usually won't even mention my parents. It can always be fun to be like, oh, my parents are here. Ha ha. Like after you say something inappropriate or something. But uh, but I like having them there. I also sometimes feel self-conscious. Like I don't want to get feedback from my parents based on the fact that they've seen me perform so many times. Like once you've seen somebody do their, their set a lot, it, the kind of novelty can wear off a bit. And I don't need to interpret feedback about my set. I don't need things that are going to like crush my confidence, especially leading into doing a special. So like if my dad has some fucking feedback about my set, I like try to take it with a grain of salt and not listen to what he has to say. If it's like crit- critical in a way that isn't helpful and doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. If he has a good suggestion, of course I'm opening to listening to it, but he, he to be honest, usually doesn't. Uh, so interesting. How, how is your dad doing? Any, any updates? Uh, yes, with the I, have, raccoons? I have updates. <laughs> Uh, but did I ever tell that story about how he had an idea for a joke for me? I don't think I told this on the pod. I need a little more. So he, he told me, he started telling me a story about something that was similar to one of my jokes. It was like a story about, and it was conveniently a story that is something in his mind that could have added to one of my jokes. Basically it's a situation where I'm talking to somebody in a store and he was like, oh, well, in this thing I saw, 
this happens and then that happens and then that happens. So I was just, I couldn't help but think about your joke. And I'm like, oh. And then he starts being like, you know, I thought that maybe that's a thing that you could, Mm. you could incorporate. And I was like, thanks for that suggestion. And at some point it becomes clear and he, he confesses for some reason. I don't know why he confessed, but that in fact that did not happen in something he saw. That was just an idea that he had for me, but he didn't want it to seem like he was trying to give me ideas. So he thought that by masking it as something he had seen, it wouldn't seem like it was as direct of feedback, Mm. which is pretty annoying. (laughs) And I didn't even like the suggestion like this in this, in this, in this story, I'm at the counter talking to somebody. I don't want to like give away what I'm talking about in jokes, but the, let's just say it's an embarrassing interaction. So his idea is that the person behind me in line is hearing what's happening and they contribute, which makes it even more embarrassing. And before you know it, everybody in the store is involved and it's funny and whatever. And I, I don't disagree that that's a potentially funny thing, but it feels more of like a curb episode to me. You know, and, I, and I'm like, why would I make things up? Like that I don't need to make up. I don't think it adds and the joke is the joke and I like it. And while I do think that there is an ending that I'm looking for with it, I don't think that this is it period. So him being like, well, why don't you listen? It's like, I get to decide if I like what you say or not, dude, you're not a comedian. You don't know anything about any of this, but except for the fact that you've seen me do it for many years and you have learned some things based on that. And occasionally you have good suggestions, but you can't get upset when I don't agree with you. You don't know any, you don't know about this, dude. That would be like me saying to him, to telling him what to write about. Mm. I'd be like, you should write, you, I, think you, I think people would like it if you wrote about this. And whenever I say that to him, he goes, I would like that. I would write about that. I'm like, dude, no, that's not fair. I don't do that to you because it would be ridiculous. The same way you shouldn't do it to me, mm-hmm. right? But he refuses to take that. No, he's my father. I guess that changes the, the vibe of it. So there's that. I don't think I've told that story on the pod. Mm-mm. So anyway, that fucking annoyed me. This is even more annoying. This weekend... I like this episode so far. Just a nice vent sash. <laughs> I'm glad. And it's fine. It's all good. It's my dad. I love the guy. He's great. But I'm, we're talking about the how much my special is going to cost, basically. And I'm saying how there might be some people who might be contributing some money and how that's a good thing. And somehow it comes up like how much roughly it's going to maybe cost. So he then starts doing some quick math and figures out how much that means I'm on the hook for. And he's like, that's a lot of money. He goes, do you have that kind of money? And I'm like, like, not that it's any of your business, but like, yes, theoretically, like I, I, I'll be able to do it. Like I don't, it's a lot maybe, but like I have it and I can make that work. And he's like, okay. We hang up the phone 20 minutes later. He calls me back and he's like, Hey, he's like, I just wanted to say this because I'm your parent and like, you know, I wouldn't forgive. I'll never be able to forgive myself if I didn't say anything. He's like, but I just hope you're not doing anything sketchy to get that money. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, he goes, it's not worth it. I'm like, dude, are you serious right now? I'm like, okay, so are these my only two options in life to give you full transparency into my finances, my bank statements, every single transaction I've ever gone through or if you don't have that information, you make assumptions that I'm an arms dealer or a drug or a drug dealer. I'm like, that is insane, dude. So I kind of like joke a little bit. He's like, no, no, I I know, but like whatever. And then I realize I'm like, I need to like make him know how offensive that is. Like that is basically him saying that he just doesn't think he basically just thinks that I don't do well (laughs) or that it's not possible that I could be doing well or that, and, and, and I explained this to him later. I called him back. I was like, are you going to apologize to me about that? And he's like, what do you mean? And he like, didn't even think about it. He laughed. He's like, I realize now how offensive that sounds. He apologized, but he's like, you know, I was doing the math in my head and it didn't seem like you have money like that. And I'm like, dude, why are you doing the math? What math is there to be done? You don't have the, this information because it's none of your fucking business. Stop being so nosy. Right. Hmm. Uh, but why do you why do you feel like you need to be able to understand? Like I get it. Like you're a parent, you want to know how your kids are doing. But like this assumption that you're able, you'll be, you would be able to do that math. You don't know enough, and we can leave it at that. And it's none of your business to know more. If you want to start, you know, I'm a man, dude, and you don't pay my bills. If you did, you and that's what I. We go back to what I was saying before about 
wanting to be rich so I can control my children. Which, by the way, my parents were upset about that comment. <laughs> my dad called me. He's like, you're missing the point, Julio. He's like, you want your kids to be independent or whatever. I'm like, okay, dad, I'm joking. But also, I have seen rich people control their kids because they give them money. And because, because they give them money, they get to have a say, period. You know what I mean? And that is an obstacle that that kid, because friends, even friends of mine whose parents have given them trust funds or whatever, they have to deal a bit more with their parents' opinions. Where even if it's like, listen, like just because you gave me money doesn't mean that you get to control me. I don't even have to have that conversation because I'm an independent adult. So dad, <laughs> I love you. Mind your own fucking business. <laughs> Uh, but it was a hilarious conversation to have to have. I'm like, we, I'm like, did you think I'm a drug dealer? Like, do you think I'm selling weapons? Like, what do you think? What are you talking about? Isn't it more viable that I might be doing well enough over time? And dude, this m amount of money we're talking is not even that significant. Any person my age, I should hope to have at least that amount of money saved up at that point. Especially because this is a young city too, New York. It's a young city. It keeps you young, meaning. Most people at my age, bro, have a family and kids. I would hope that they have that amount of money saved. And I know a lot of people in America live paycheck to paycheck, whatever. But it's not that crazy to think that I've, you know, saved up this modest amount of money over my 37 years of, of being alive. He wants to feel like I'm okay. And that I'm doing well and that he doesn't have to worry about me. He knows how unstable this job is in theory. And I made this point too. I'm like, look, like you don't know anybody else who does this personally. So you are right to, you know, because you know a bit more about the, the struggle and whatever, you know that this is a challenging life decision, what, I'm, what I've chosen to do. But because you don't know anybody else who does it, you don't know anybody else who's been successful. So therefore, maybe it's hard to imagine that I could possibly be successful because it is so unlikely. It's a hard thing to be successful in. So because of the, the odds, you're playing the odds here. You're like, this. He, it must be hard for him. He must be going, it is hard for me. But like, he must not be doing well. I, I'm putting words in his mouth. I don't think he thinks that that specifically, but I think he is worried about it in general. So when he finds out that I'm making any amount of money specifically that's a lot to him, he can take a sigh of, uh, of relief there. You know what I mean? Okay, mm -hmm. I know he'll be fine for now. So I understand wanting to feel that. And I think that that fuels some of the nosiness. So if I get a gig, he'll be like, he'll be like, how much? Mm -hmm. He'll say it like that too, like naughty, how much? <laughs> and I'm like, don't worry about it, dude. You know? Um, so there's an element of that, which then makes me be more understanding, but I need to also not be understanding because it's ultimately ridiculous behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, no more nosiness, dude. Uh, but look, he took the feedback. He's not typically that stubborn. And if he says something offensive and I bring that to light, he can typically accept it. So I think we had healthy communication and we moved on. Nice. And it was all good. Cool. Dude, as somebody that's like orally fixated, <laughs> when I'm not chewing gum while I'm working, I love the new breakers. That, oh, the Lucy uh, pouches? Yeah, that Lucy just came out with. They're fantastic. If you if you know your pouches, you know that nicotine doesn't hit immediately, and uh, neither does the flavor. I mean, they, they really pack a punch. You have these capsules, and you just put them in your mouth. You break them with your teeth, feels which great. feels really good, <laughs> and uh, has a really satisfying pop. I, I love it while I'm editing or I'm just uh, hanging out. Honestly, it's, it's, it's just fantastic. And nobody's doing anything like this except Lucy. It's a brand new kind of pouch technology. Only they do it. Lucy has been at the top of the nicotine product game for quite some time now, and the Breakers pouches are where it's at. They make them in both four and eight milligram of tobacco-free, 100% pure nicotine. Great flavors like apple ice and espresso, as well mm. as classics like mint and mango. Mm. I love the espresso. I like the mango. The morning coffee. The mango is great too. Mm. So anyway, break up your dusty gas station pouches and go to lucy.co slash oops. Use promo code oops and get 20% off your first order. Lucy offers free shipping and has 30-day refund policy if you change your mind. That's lucy.co. Use code oops to get 20% off and always free shipping. And here comes the fine print. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age and every order is age verified. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. I want to ask you, dude. So your Chipotle thing has really become huge. And I'm seeing all these posts about it and like they're quoting you and you're the leader of this thing that people are now talking about in almost like a zeitgeist way where it's just the thing people think about Chipotle now. People think now that Chipotle skims on portions because of you. 
Thanks. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And I know <laughs> this is, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, um, but it's awesome that it's spread like this. Yeah, and I had a feeling, hilarious. I had a feeling that, that it would, because so many people love to go there mm-hmm. and it's just like an abusive relationship that you don't want to leave because <laughs> it's, let's, let's say you're date, you're like married to Chipotle and everything's fine. And then they start cheating on you or cheating you out. Uh, and you want to stay with Chipotle. You like Chipotle. You don't necessarily like the other options that much more. You have to have a new set of ground rules so that you can foster a good relationship in the future, which is why we're doing the walkouts. And people are walking out. People are actually people walking are out. walking out. People are walking out. They're getting called out. You look at any it's of the videos crazy, that they yeah. post online. And they and tag I, you in them and stuff? Yeah, they, yeah, they tag they tag me, but more importantly, they say chip chop. They say chip measuring chop. cups. They say that's an unrealistic portion size. And I feel bad for the influencers out there that get a nice you know gig to to post some branded content for Chipotle um, because those videos are just getting bashed. They're getting face fucked. With, sorry, sorry for that. I didn't need to say that, but I did. But that's exactly what's happening. So that's that was maybe the right way to, to, to say what's happening in the comment section. They're giving these unrealistic, beefy, steroid boosted portions to these influencers, these ASMR people. And they're like, look what I got a chip today. And, you know, everyone can like, read Cap. through the bullshit. All cap, dude. <laughs> so um, I don't know what the next step is. Um, I don't want the content to become redundant to the point where the message is just like, all right, we get it. Um, but I think I might go to Chipotle soon and I might record the whole interaction and, uh, obviously not, it'll, it'll be a hidden camera (laughs) kind of man that I am. And, uh, if I get a good portion, great. If I don't, I'll walk out and just continue to, you know, let people see walk out in the middle of the, well, I'm going to finish the order. I'm going to double guac it up. And then, uh, I'm gonna really load the bowl and make sure that it's the most out. expensive uh, waste of uh, produce you and dog. potential profit for them. Well, dude, I like just how it be. I'd like to expand this metaphor a bit. So, I let's say the marriage one. So, let's say it's like you get you're you're married to Chipotle. You have a great relationship. You have a great sex life, and then as the relationship progresses, Chipotle is now less and less uh, sexual. And less libido. Less libido, less interested, and you know you're in bed at night and you're tapping Chipotle on the shoulder, or maybe you're you're rubbing Chipotle's thigh, mm-hmm. but Chipotle is just I'm tired every night to the point where you now are like this is not what I signed up for. Chipotle used to be, you know, a king in the sack, dude. Chipotle, a queen. well, or maybe a king, or maybe, maybe a Chipotle queen. is a man, and you are in a relationship with him, and that's a yeah, and that's okay. That is okay. Ryan. That's what that could be. <laughs> But Chipotle's not putting out anymore. Yeah. Okay. Chipotle was a real fox, was a real, you know, fun time in the sack. Yeah. And now Chipotle has turned into a dead fish, a cold shouldered, cold lover who's too preoccupied with whatever else they're going on. And it's up to you to stand up, walk out of that apartment. Yeah, I mean, sex is very important in all relationships. It is like that is uh, to is some to some Chipotle. to some people that's their love language. That's right, making love. So <laughs> if yeah, if Chipotle is giving the cold shoulder like that, you know, Chip can't be surprised that I'm uh, next to her or him in bed, scrolling through Cadoba's menu. Yeah, or uh, salsa fresca or Moe's. Moe's. There's plenty love of Mo's. other love Mo's. options they for that have, fast they all casual. Better queso. Yeah. And guess what? Cordoba has better quesadillas. Yeah. So Chipotle. Yeah. And, you know, things are great. 2013, first time I went to Chipotle. It um, was the day I got my driver's license. <laughs> I wanted to go there. That's the place to be. That's mm-hmm. that's the one that you want. I sought him out. <laughs> it's a guy. Chip's a guy. <laughs> and uh, I waited in a really long line. He gave you the eyes from across the bar, Chipotle. I, yeah, I waited in a really long line. And you know what? It was worth the wait. You look at the fun metal walls that mm-hmm. was a vibe sure is. 10 years ago 11 years ago wow it's been a long time yeah, and long relationship. You know, the, 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 the sex has just gotten worse <laughs> and worse there's better options out there so you, you better shape up um shape up your body you better shape up chip chop that's all i can say right now i like it bro very good thanks um well dude, i don't the the jeffrey epstein sort of like 
information, I guess, has become declassified or to some degree. Like someone published this list of people who were associated with Jeffrey Epstein in some capacity. Now, a lot of the names are just in there for reasons that have nothing to do with going to the island. So I don't know specifically enough, but maybe you can look this up. But Stephen Hawking's name is sort of mentioned in this whole thing. <laughs> the internet. Which is pretty funny. Uh, now, Stephen Hawking is kind of famously a dog. I guess we've like figured out. And I know they, they made the movie about him where they cover some of that. But does that surprise anyone, dude? I mean, the man looks at the women as, as particles. Clearly, he's not concerned about hurting their feelings. You know, if you are that scientific that you look through the humanity of people... It shouldn't be that shocking to us that Stephen Hawking was a dog. If you break things down in that capacity about anything, you take the life away from people and things. Okay. And you take away the significance of interpersonal relationships. It's all just particles. Mm. So obviously a guy like that is more likely to be a cheater, in my opinion. So Yeah. So yeah, he was on the list. I think I think the list that came out isn't the flight logs. It's just a compilation of names that were associated with him. So, so we still was, haven't gotten the flight logs. So there was no specific way to discern who is a person who was down there hooking up with underage people yeah. versus who did was he a just secretary meet at a charity event. For a charity event. Okay. So yeah, and I don't know if that's ever going to come out because it seems like that's been on its way to come out for years and years. And, and people years. are acting like it's a conspiracy that's he's keeping it from coming out. But you know, not that crazy of one. I mean, some of these powerful people who were supposedly down there, Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, whatever, if these guys were implicated in some way, obviously they're probably powerful enough to stop something like that from coming out. Yeah. And that's not even that conspiratorial. That's just like, can we not publish this guys? Here's a bunch of money. Yeah. Just be quiet. <laughs> I think the conspiracy theory, like, renaissance has, like, started because of COVID. Like, everybody just was stuck at home and they, they got. Uh, just enthralled in all of these different theories and looking mm. into them and then falling down rabbit holes with all the free time and the isolation. And that's like, that's when I heard about the whole, the Ep all the Epstein stuff. I watched like these YouTube videos oh, like that alive. have since been. Uh, I think the internet really helps too. Like, like quote fake news. Like you can just say whatever theory you want and make it sound compelling and not have to include a ton of information that completely debunks whatever you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite conspiracy theory? I'm not a big conspiracy theory guy, man. No. Um, I don't typically, like, if people are like, yeah, it makes sense, it makes sense. I'm like, I don't see <laughs> any reason to, like, believe whatever that is that you're talking about. So I don't, I try not to go down the rabbit hole because if you listen to something enough, you start to believe it. Mm -hmm. I think anybody, and, you know, it's been true in really tragic ways throughout history. Um, and I think it can potentially be true with that kind of conspiracy theory stuff. So any anytime I hear some fact or, or some story about something crazy like that. I try to read the stuff that debunks it. Mm -hmm. It's usually pretty easy to find if you, if you're looking for it. Uh, and I'm sure that there are some that maybe hold more weight than others, which then become like less conspiratorial. It's like, that's just a fact. You know what I mean? But I'm not too concerned about covering up aliens or nine 11 being an inside job. I don't believe that at all. Um, there's a lot of that stuff. I don't believe I'm yeah. sure people will send me a bunch of shit now. But save your save your time. I mean, like, if if you want to send me some stuff, I'll look at it. I guess, but most of the or time, say no. It's bullshit. No, but I'm look. I'm willing to. I don't want to make the same mistake that those people are making, which is they're not willing to listen to more reliable sources about some of these things, debunking these crazy things that they think. Mm. So if you want to, if you want to send me some stuff, I guess go for it. But. I, you're going to have trouble convincing me. Yeah. I just find them interesting. What, what are you into? Which ones do you like? I think I mentioned this to you. I went to the bathroom last week, but the, um, the conspiracy theory that fascinates me the most is the one where Michael Jackson is still alive. Oh yeah. yeah bro. <laughs> That's just, those are cr like, that one is like so fringe. You know what I mean? Like some of them are like more, seem more, more fair than others. Would you would say that one's very outlandish? That one's ridiculous. Like I, something where they're like, it wasn't really a suicide. He was murdered. Like I can like get behind some of those sometimes. Uh -huh. Even like the Jeffrey Epstein one. Like that feels m like a more reasonable one than Michael Jackson or Tupac still being alive. Mm. However, I also see plenty of incentive for Jeffrey Epstein to kill himself. If I were him, I would have fully been looking for ways to kill myself. He'd be the guy. But that one feels more reasonable than some of these people who are obviously dead being alive. Yeah. Elvis, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's the Michael Jackson one? 
Just that, you know, uh, <laughs> his life became so crazy that, you know, uh, having a different identity would allow him to continue living. And so I saw a video shortly after he passed, which, quick fact, he died the same day as Billy Mays, which is pretty interesting. I think in 2009 or 10. But I saw this video clip of the ambulance uh, that he was su uh, supposedly in being transported from the, uh, his home to the hospital or from the hospital to a different location, going into a garage, and then a man with his silhouette hopping out and like looking left and right and then going into some like bunker style. Dude, I know you're rolling your eyes, but really also difficult. in it's that really video, difficult. they also do show uh, this this odd person with a ton of makeup on and uh, uh, like, a, like a fake face sitting towards the front row uh, at Michael Jackson's funeral. And supposedly that was him. <sighs> ridiculous so. if you're faking your own death dude you wouldn't show up to your own fucking funeral also it's really difficult to fake your own death i don't think people are have been very successful doing it in the past and i have trouble believing that michael jackson is running around alive Fair. but I, mean, <laughs> I know that you like think it's funny and like i don't think you believe it do you oh i also i don't think it's that funny but you it's, believe it that video that i watched convinced me and i haven't watched it since i haven't looked into it since 10 years ago, 13 years ago is when I saw it. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots on it. You know, people like he was a kind of, the kind of person that would rent out grocery stores so that he could go grocery shopping. It was he was such a big person. Uh, he could not live any semblance of a normal life. So to be able to. Uh, to 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 be able to start fresh start over like I could see how that would be an attractive option for somebody uh, of his right. celebrity status so do I believe it um I don't know but it would not it wouldn't surprise I'd be shocked but it wouldn't surprise me if if My that was the case was okay well and I, so I I think out of all the conspiracy theories I if I had to pick something that I have the most faith in if I had to gamble and put my chips towards, it would be that Michael Jackson's still okay. alive. Well, I encourage you to look into that a bit more. <laughs> and I also like, I don't know if you're just like being funny to prove the point that like, or at least to, to show, give an example of what these people that we're talking about are like. I can't fully tell. No. But um, I will say this, dude. I get why that would be. How? So explain this to me. How would he pull that off? First of all, he would reconstruct his face. Okay. So, so he would look like a face. completely different person. Got it. Okay. That and, would be the only way. And, and yeah. Okay. Um, that's it. Okay. So brand new face because yeah, he, he was already living a life of sort of like needing to be away from things cause he couldn't get around much cause he was so famous. He was such a tabloid people. The tabloids were obsessed with him, addicted to him. Mm -hmm. So he could hunker down or rent out a grocery store or so now he can walk around freely. He can go to Starbucks and order and he's unburdened by the life of fame because he's dead, but he's alive. Yeah. Got it. I am open to the idea that the government covers things up and that sometimes it's better for us not to know things because we'd be afraid or it's, it would cause panic. And therefore, you know, there are times where, and there's a debate about this, like, is it good for the government? This is a discussion. Should we know every single thing or should the government to some degree have some discretion over what are things that we should know versus what things we should not know? And I'm fine with the latter in theory. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can handle some things. And in that capacity, you know, things come out sometimes that we didn't know about and they're surprising and they're scandalous. And I think that we, the, the, the gray area between that and conspiracy theories is becoming too muddled because, you know, traditionally conspiracy theories are just like crazy fringe theories where, there are these insane things happening like lizard men and, and children being eaten and all this crazy shit that people think um, versus things that are plausible cover-ups or realistic things. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a sliding scale of things that are more possible than others potentially. Well, can we transition? Can I ask you one question? Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me who is wrong in this situation? So I went to a coffee shop a couple days ago and you know how they have those ropes for lines? Like they have them when you're going like through security at the yeah. airport. And you can sort of like craft the structure of the line. Exactly. So this coffee shop that I walked into, they, they had those ropes. Now, there wasn't a sign that said line starts here. It just had a sign right above the counter that said order here. Mm -hmm. So I walk in. There's no line. Uh, can you explain how the ropes were arranged? Yeah. So you walk in right. Let's say right in front of you is the counter. 
between you and the counter is a rope. Okay. There, it, it, which way is it, the rope? And the rope is uh, is blocking, and so it's it's horizontal. Got it. It's horizontal. You're facing it's it horizontally. The yeah. So and it's, how it's, long is it? It is. There's one that's horizontal, and then there's one at a 45 degree angle to the left of you. To the left of you. Towards the, okay, the interior. It. Okay. So it's sort of like send you in that direction. Yeah. So th this is kind of important. Like that. Th this is kind of the identifier as to who, who could be wrong in the situation. So I walk in and like I said, there's no, there's no enter here. There's no line starts here. It's just order here. And it's right in front of the counter. But the, the rope is the horizontal rope is directly in front of the register. And then the diagonal one in theory is suggesting where, what direction you should go in. Yes. And it's deeper in now there's guy number one. He's already in the middle of his order. And so I go to the right and I go around because it's the least amount of walking to get into this line that I don't know exists. I don't know if it's on the left side. I don't know if it's on the right side. So I just go to the place that is, isn't in the way. And the way the ordering process goes, it's from right to left from my angle. Okay. That's all we need to know. From right to left. Okay. So then the, no, but I, I need to know a bit more. So yeah. from right to left. So, but you, but the diagonal rope is on the left. So then to you, does that signify that the diagonal rope is the area that you should be waiting in after you've ordered as opposed to where the line should form? So that's what's in question. That's what I okay. believed, what you said. Um, so guy number one's in the middle of his order. There's nobody else on either side. There's no one behind me. I stand over to the right. The guy is taking his order. It's taking a couple of minutes. I'm up next. I'm the next person there. A guy walks into the coffee shop and he goes around and he goes on the left side. So he's standing there and uh, guy number one leaves and we'll call him guy number three because I'm guy number two. <laughs> guy number one leaves and then uh, there's a woman behind me and there's the guy on the other side. And he looks at me and the woman who are closer to him and says, hey guys, there's, we, we have a line system. Uh, please go around the ropes mm -hmm. and stand there. And so I looked at the guy, guy number two, and he looked at me dead in the eyes and he just walked forward. We, we looked at each other for three wow. seconds. And I was, try, I was trying to be like, the, I was like trying to non-verbally be like, Is it, do you mind? Because I was right. here first. Like, I, we know I was here first. And uh, he looked me dead in the eyes. And uh, it was like, a, it was th like three seconds. Because I stared. Because I was a little surprised. And I didn't make a face. But I was I, like, we looked at each other for, you know, three seconds. And then he went up and he ordered his coffee. And I had to go around the back. And I ended up ordering after him. And I thought that was fucked up. Dude, that sucks. The people, in my opinion, who are at fault in that situation are not just that guy, but also the register guy. Mm -hmm. Because he should have told you. So the only thing, though, is that there's nobody else there. So he's like, this isn't going to matter because nobody else is coming in. This fucking idiot who's at the register is like, uh, no, they think, should I put the hazelnut? Actually, no. Scratch the hazelnut. One, uh, he's taken forever. So now the guy at the register doesn't think he's going to have to say this to you mm -hmm. because if he's like the lines over there, you're like, dude, there's no one else here. Why should I go to the line? Mm -hmm. But then as other people start to come, he then has to be like to now tell you he's like the lines actually over there. Mm -hmm. At which point that guy should go, dude, you were here already. It's all good. Exactly. I was just waiting for that. Yeah. And yeah, I, you know, as much as I, I hate the guy that didn't let me go, it really is on the person behind the counter. And if the person behind the counter is annoyed, or sorry, if he's worried that he's going to annoy you by being like, dude, I'm sorry, you have to go over there. Once you get to the register, he can be like, the only reason why I told you that is because what happens sometimes is other people will come in and then it would have sucked for you. So I just wanted to make sure that if other, and then it would have been all good. Yeah, hundred percent. But yeah, fuck that guy. It just didn't dude, happen. Those situations give me a lot of anxiety <laughs> for that reason. Cause I'm like, oh, I thought I was waiting in the right place, but apparently I wasn't. And usually people will be like, no, you were here. And I'll, I would do that too. I'd be like, this, he was there. Yeah. You know, uh, the same way that the guy that shook that your sucks. hand and looked away. I remember the guy uh, that did not let me go in front of him. Yeah. If you I see should, him walking through a crosswalk, you should run him over. Oh, 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. Oh, I just I just want to say one more thing. We we're, we open up the show talking about snow and what a treat it is to not have a car in the city when it's snowing outside. What a luxury. I've lived here for almost two years now and snow has never stuck. And one of the great things about not having a car is that you don't need to move it. You don't need a shovel. 
You have zero responsibilities. You don't need to have the thing that you wipe off of it. No, that the terrible scratcher. In the and, top. Yeah. And you just get to enjoy the the the, the beauty and the freedom of not having a child parked on the street. A hundred percent. So uh, I woke up this morning uh, particularly excited to have snow on the ground, not melted. And uh, walking here in sludge made me so happy just knowing that I don't have to do anything here. Yeah. Just like nice. it's, it's not it's not our responsibility. Yeah, because it was annoying. You're like I gave the car up and one of the main perks I haven't been able to enjoy because the snow has not stuck at all. Spot on. So good for you. And I will say this. When you run that guy over, make sure you follow the ambulance and that you're the one who identifies his body because otherwise he might get a new face and might be living life as somebody else in Cuba. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. You do not want We don't want, want this to guy happen. to get a free ride, okay? No, he is him and that is how he will always be. <laughs> Correct. 100%. Uh, well, guys, Oops the Podcast, another year. We're in the dog days of winter. If you live anywhere that is not hugging Mexico or in Florida, you know that it's going to be cold for a bit. It sucks. Take this time to reflect on your life and make some sort of plan for your future if yeah. you don't have as much uh, desire to go outside because it's so cold. Use the time wisely. Maybe take a break from doing some bad shit. Yeah. Get in shape. Do whatever you got to do uh, to come out of it ready to rip for a nice summer when that weather arrives. Mm -hmm. Come see me on the road. Uh, the 16th, I'm filming my special in Chicago. It's going to be great. 13th, I'm in Union Hall in Brooklyn running that hour. It'll probably be the last time I do it before I record my special. So... I guess if there's some value to you there to see that, come check it out. The first, Lynch and I are going to be in Stamford together at New York Comedy Club Stamford. Pumped for that. It's going to be, be really great. fun. Come out. Uh, and am I forgetting anything? No. Send us emails at oopsthepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know if you've had similar situations like that, those anxiety-inducing uh, confrontations. Those are the worst. Especially when you're not a confrontational person. And if you're doing dry January, good luck. You're a third of the way through. You're almost there. Or not? No, you're two three fourths. You're, you're, yeah, you're two thirds or you're three fourths. You're three weeks in, and we're very proud of you. And we hope uh, whatever your dry January or your New Year's resolution is that you're you're sticking with it so far. So you you can do it. You can do you it. You can do it. <laughs>